So, we noticed when we went to see the film that you, uh, continuity of the soundscape from the first film to the second one was sustained. And I liked the way that you took their arboreal environment and it shifted to an aquatic one. And I was disinterested in your creative process in writing the score for this film. So obviously this is, there are a number of things. I wouldn't be here if James Horner had died because James was gonna do all of the sequels. Secondly, this is the second of a canon of films. And therefore, there has to be a coherent approach. There has to be, you know, it can't be that each score is somehow isolated from the other. And the second score shouldn't be isolated from the first score. Thirdly, I was responsible for the sound world on, on Avatar 1, mostly, so that Although James was obviously composing and writing, the, you know, the, everything to do with the, you know, writing, the actual creation of the sound of Pandora, the, the non-orchestral elements was my world. So it wasn't particularly difficult for me to, to, repeat, to continue that because that's what I had been doing anyway. So the percussion, the glowing forest, the use of gamelan bells and so on, that had been the area that I'd been uh, that's where I, that's why I was, my credit in A1 was electronic music arranger. And so that's sort of where, my, that was my wheelhouse. For me, that actually brought the wonder and awe of Pandora to well, both films. Well, I hopefully, I mean, I, there was, I made a conscious decision, which was uh, the, you know, we had a thing on, on, in, where Water and the sequels. We have a thing called Culture Club. And Culture Club is me, that is Dev Scott, the costume designer, Dylan Cole and Ben Proctor, the um, production, design, so, uh, uh, production designers, uh, prop masters, and so on. And we, there's a, the idea that Jim will always say that you couldn't, you can't make shit up. There had to be an analog to something on earth for everything that you, you do. And there also had to be a coherent approach. And so one of the things I looked at was when I, the sort of the, the world of the Omatakaya, the forest people, you know, I'd, 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 I remember when I was wor first working on the bioluminescence of the night scene, it occurred to me that it reminded me of gamelan and I started using these sort of gamelan textures and the bells and the glowing thing. And that was an approach that I took. When, I, when we looked at the Metkayina, part of this is they were a slightly simpler tribe in some ways, especially given now these many years of Jake and Neytiri having become more, you know, they've got Jake who's a human and understood uh, the background. They've had this battle, the war, there's everything else. So they're a more sophisticated tribe in so many more ways. And they've been through a lot than, for instance, the Metkayina, who are much more sort of, should we say, um, they're much more simple tribe in some ways. And, um, but I also, you know, they're a sea-going tribe. And I looked at nomadic cultures around the world. I looked at sea cultures around the world. Um, and there were certain things that were very obvious to me. One was that I had to move from that gamelan glowy bell thing to, uh, bamboo, to wood, to clay pots, to the sort of things that you would do so that I worked, I, I, all of the percussion moves to that sort of sound of things, that the tuned percussion becomes, you know, those sorts of textures. So I've made a conscious decision and then I looked at the vocal textures. So we had this really hard, edgy, the kappa type sound that was in A1. Um, a2, I looked more at the Polynesian vocal textures and, and also Mongolian nomadic textures, which are much longer notes and flowing things. And so in the end, I used singers from um, Vanuatu and Cook Islands and some of the islands out there. And we brought them, they were in Wellington, we recorded them. And that was to get a different vocal texture for 
them. And that was a conscious decision, again. Can you talk a little bit about your um, thematic ideas? I mean, obviously, one of the awards you won today is for the for Home Tree, which is the, the new main theme yeah. for Avatar 2. What did you bring over from Avatar 1, and or what was new in Avatar 2? We talked about it at length, Jim and I. But one of the things was that the ICU theme, as we would call it, was something we felt was a Jake and Neytiri thing. And he also also wants to sometimes uses it for flying. He thinks it's flying. But it is very much meant to be, that's Jake and Neytiri's theme. For the two of them, their love story. And the very, very first thing I ever wrote was song chord. Because on the script, literally on the first paragraph of the script, you know, it says Neytiri sings the song chord, and then it goes through and explains what Neytiri was doing. She's singing the lives of her family. Um, so I had to, that was the first thing Jim asked me to do, was to write something for Zoe to sing. Because there had to be, she couldn't just make it up on set. So, but then I also had to find a story that worked. So I, you know, the, the why, how do you sing a song chord? So I looked at, again, cultures around the world, and there is a repeating theme, which is the idea of, um, you, uh, you see it in, I think it's the Apaches in uh, Native American. You see it also in some uh, Asian um, uh, cultures, which is the idea that, l Life is a spark. The spark then gives you the dawn, and then the dawn become you carry and you walk from the dawn through the day, and then you walk towards the sunset. And that became that would became the 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 key, the the core for what I was attempting to do with my uh, with my lyrics. Is that the, when you're singing, the idea of song chord is that you have, you could pick up a song chord and it is a string of beads and you can sing anybody's life. You can sing your grandparents' life. But you could also sing 10 generations ago and sing the life of somebody because each of those beads would, revent, would represent a particular element and a particular part of their life. And so she is putting on the first beads of her children. Oh, and this first one, I think it's an Ateum. She's putting the first beads on the Tam song chord, and so on. And then I also did one for Kiri, and I did I did uh, song chords for all of the children. We just used I think only in Tam and Kiri in in uh, A two, um, and but that because I'd written now I had a theme which was the song chord theme. I then expanded that. I did a orchestral mock up of that for Jim, and Jim loved that and said, right, that is the family theme. And it, I wanted it to have a sort of slightly mystic quality. It, it isn't meant to be, you know, it was meant to have a sense of that there, it's meant, it can be, you hear it in a more positive fashion and in something like happiness is simple. It's in the background there. Uh, and it, so I, I do manipulate it at times, but it is meant to have a sense of time about it and so on. So that was the first theme. Then came, I wrote off the script, um, something I called Skimming the Waves, which was the arrival of the Tolkien. And that was literally, I just, it came to me. Um, and I ended up splitting it into two bits. Um, I had an introduction section, which ended up being Pyakan's theme. Yeah, he's the individual one. In the one, with, right? yeah. yeah. So Pyakan, which has this, uh, and that came from a thought, you know, that, that was um, something that also came from discussions with whale specialists from the Scripps Institute. Wow. Because Chris Boys and I were talking about, you know, uh, we would, she told us how whales make sound. And I started, there was a point when we were thinking, well, maybe the Tolkien were going to sing. And so I was started to work out how I could create themes. And I started looking at overtones. And then once I started working on overtones, I came up with this um, bomb, 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 with this thing, which is basically the circle of fifths. But it's just the messed up circle of fifths. Right. And um, 
So that became, because that was about resonant overtones, how you create the, the tones that something like a Tulkun could sing. The Tulkun also has two swim bladders, so it can actually generate two notes at the same time, not one. It's modeled in that the, 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 the level of detail that they go into, into Weta and into the modeling, includes things like the fact that it has two swim bladders. And when you see it the first time, you see these two sets of breath, breath holes along the top, that's part of that. But, but it's fascinating to me that that would actually inform your music too. Like you can take elements from the... You can't make effects. shit up. I know, but exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's it, just, yeah. It, it's about... It's about... That's the level of detail that Jim requires. Yeah. So I started with that, then I came up with this theme, the that one, which is the main body of that. And that became my Metkayina theme, which was about their connection to water. And you hear it in its angelic form when they first hear, when the kids first jump into the water. I wanted it to be sirens singing. I wanted there to be the idea of almost that whole point of come to the water. So there I made this sort of sirens call, but it's the same theme as the, when the Tolkien return. It's actually the, exactly the same tune, just played in, in different ways. Because obviously they're related, it's all water. Right? That's water connection. Yeah. So there's that. So that was another, it was important to him that the Metkayina had that, that there is that connection there. Pyakan then has his longer, more elongated version, which was a, my initial introduction became a longer theme for Pyakan, which I did any number of different versions before I played it to Jim, um, because it was just trying to find the right place, and I'd gone off with synthesizers here and this, and you know, they were, to get to this point where I thought it had the grace and the, there was a balletic quality to Pyakan that it needed to have. Um, that's so we now have Pyrocan, so that's three themes. Then he said to me, uh, very early on, he said, we don't have an Imperial March. <laughs> we do not have our version of the baddies theme. Right. So I did this thing, which I sort of based, it's a tritone thing, basically. Um, and you hear it, if there's a dum dum ba da 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 da, you know, and then ba 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 da ba da da da. That there's this sort of left hand right hand thing going on, and that is the RDA's theme. And there is a subset of RDA's theme which is Courage's theme, which actually I know it fits inside, but it's it's a complicated puzzle to get it to work. But there is the trumpet thing that goes the, which is the thing that Jim said that he liked the idea of. The, the quarriage should be a almost last post, solo trumpet type thing, because that's quarriage. He is a dead soldier coming back to life. Right. Um, so we have the RDA thing, and you hear the RDA in, in the, um, a new star when the ships land, you hear it whenever we go to the, to the um, Hell's Gate, the main area. And you hear it in some of the fights as well and so on. And that is very much, that's low. I change the percussion, becomes not tribal percussion, it becomes electronic drums. So that the drum sounds change, it becomes much more about low brass and, and obviously that. So now we have an RDA theme and a subset of Quarridge's theme. Um, and then we had Kiri. And Kiri needed a theme for herself. And there is a bigger Kiri theme that will appear. That is the the, the Kiri theme that we have here is uh, then expands and becomes. A, there is a bigger theme there. Uh, what I like about a lot of what you do is, especially in a lot of the action sequences, is, is you've got these juxtapositions of themes going on. You've got themes playing against yeah. each other to simulate the the conflict, and also all throughout the hunt sequence. Is, that's the RDA theme, but it's almost, it feels triumphant at that point because they don't see themselves as the bad guys. They're, they're, they're off he, on an adventure. This is exactly what Jim said to me. Yeah. Said, he said, it needs to be like, hey, we're off on a, it's, it's a great, they're, they're having it's great fun. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's, we're going off hunting and it's like, hey, we're going off hunting. And he, and he said, you want to that point where you twist the knife yeah. at the end and you twist the knife in as the point when you realize how just unpleasant and vile they are. Yeah. Um, and, but he wanted, so 
that whole sequence there, I'm very proud of the of the Tolkien hunt. I, it's probably in terms of piece of music. There is actually a longer. It got chopped in in editing the actual film sequence. There was a point where it was a lot tougher to watch, and quite rightly, I, I think it got tidied up a little bit. Um, and I. I think I made this, I, for some reason it, it became the Confutatis from, uh, from Mozart Requiem. Confutatis, dum ba da dum ba da da ba da da ba da 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 dum and then ba da ba da ba da 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 Right, all that thing. So we have them dum bum 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 all them. And then you have the variation of the Tolkien the of the Pyrkan theme but played on high female voices. Right. So that sh the choir then sings, and so you have this left hand, right hand thing going on between the Tolkun and the, and the hunter. As, and then it obviously then just gets worse and worse and worse. Of course. I wanted to go back a little bit um, to early in your career. And obviously you have a, a, a very long connection with James Horner. Yeah. You started working with him on Titanic. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little about your relationship with James Horner and how you came to work with him in the first place and then how that moved into Avatar 1? I was working with Alan Silvestri on Contact mm. and he had the same agent um, as James Horner and they knew that I was the guy who could create like whole orchestras in the Synclavia and I could use synthesizers. I'd done a lot of I did a lot of creative synthesizer work for other people, so Seven with Howard Shaw, I was the, made all the electronica for that. There were, um, and they said, we've got this film, will you go and see, would you be interested in going to talking to James Horner? I'd never met. I'd done a couple of pop songs that he'd been involved in, but that was it. Yeah. Um, and um, he gave me, a test which was the first, I actually I found it the other day, is my first, my draft sketch, which was the sinking. I was given a super VHS cassette of the sinking. Um, and, we, and I had to make something up for that. Um, there was no money. There was no money. So there was, the budget was microscopic. Uh, I can't, I won't tell, you know, I can't tell you publicly what it was, but it was terrible. And they managed to find some money for inverted commas demos. Right. And so I was hired to create the electronica side of things along with the legendary Ian Underwood, who was his longtime synth player. But Ian was a, had a different role. Mine was, I was programming and I also had to act as the engineer because we had no money for an engineer at this point. Sean came in later, but um, so we went to this small studio in Calabasas called Castle Oaks. And I set up and I remember calling equipment manufacturers up to borrow equipment from them because we had no money. So we recorded, the synths were recorded through a Mackie desk into Tascam DA88s that I had stacked up and I was using Mackie speakers 5.1 because those were what I could get right. people to lend me. And um, so I recorded all the synths and with there, and there was the three of us were in a room about maybe small, smaller than this. And when there we had Ian, James, like a keyboard like this. So we had Ian one side, James in the middle, a little gap where Jim would come in and sit on a, on, a, uh, on a chair, and then I would be on the right. Ian and I had our racks of racks of gear because we had tons of equipment. We they were stuffed off somewhere else, and then. There was a Neve desk there, but the Neve was not particularly reliable, so we were doing it. We, we were sort of like using that partially, but mainly we were using our internal stuff. So we started working, and it became very evident that more and more of the, the score was going to be synthetic because there was so little money. But I was, you know, so we did these hybridized things like the Take Her to See Mr. Murder, which, are, you know, 2015, we did a live version at. Albert Hall and I had to go back and revisit this. I had this idea that it was all big orchestral and I, I had this, nah, I'll take a scene Mr. Murdoch in the film, it's, if it's four and a half minutes long, 
three minutes 45 of it's just synths. The whole thing, and I'd forgotten listening back and going, oh wow, yeah, there were, really was. We were just like using the synths wherever we could. Things like the dum bum ba da dum dum ba da dum ba ba da da dum. So those voices, which were we made up of a patch of about seven different synths and the synclavier and between me and Ian, that was meant to be the Harlem Boys Choir. We didn't have the money to use the Harlem Boys Choir, so that stuck. And but that's almost become iconic. I mean, that sound is like very much associated with Titanic now. It's there because we couldn't afford anything else. <laughs> wow. Okay, so, um, which tells you that it's always about the notes. Yeah. Right. The notes were good. Yeah. Um, and, um, uh, and also, we were trying to do interesting things. I mean, I think it was fair to say that creatively on the synth side of things, like there is a bit at the beginning, when you go down through Titan, through the first initial, we were building these textures. I was taking up samples of, you know, like trombones and putting them down two octaves, and then we manipulate them with synths. And so we were trying to create these hybridized approaches. Um, and then there was orchestra put in later, and you can hear some fabulous, obviously, there's fabulous orchestral cues. Yeah. But initially, for instance, the syncing was purely, you know, I had it, I demoed it up in the synclavia, and then gradually that got replaced with a real orchestra later on in the process. So then you, um, there was a long gap. Yeah, so I, I then was, I'd done obviously, my heart will go on, did very well, and yes. I'd produced the song for the, well, with James for the end and of the film. And you Grammy for that too, right? Yeah, I won yeah. for record of the year. Yeah. And I had been doing, so many things. I was a session player in, in LA, basically. I had been a record producer in England. I came up, got persuaded to, America, to move to America. But I was, I'd done hundreds of records. And, hundred, and I was doing dozens, you know, I would be doing any number of films. And there came a point where I said, you know, he asked me to do the, some, the next thing and I just said, I think I'm sick of doing programming for other people. And um, so I stopped doing that. I was producing, I was writing things, some songs, and then I had to go back to England for family reasons. So um, I was in England for several years, and, and every so often we, you know, I think I bumped into them at um, Abbey Road once they were doing Apocalypto or something like that. And I was back out here producing Tony Braxton, and Ian. And James phoned me up and said, hey, look, we know you don't do this anymore, but come and have a look at this movie. So I drove out to Calabasas and they showed me five minutes of Avatar and said, would you be willing to do, you know, come up, would you come and work with us again? And I said, well, what about a week? Um, and I, in that week I did I may have done the bioluminescence of the night. I definitely did the rhythmic approach to Jake's first flight. So the, oh, sorry, excuse my friend. But no, the, right. All of that stuff. So I, I um, and it was obvious that we were actually, that, that it, there was a thing where there was a good creative flow. Um, and, we ended up again with Ian on one side and James having a keyboard in the middle and me on the right. Uh, but what would often happen is that James would write something and then hand it over to me and then I'd start playing and just working on headphones, creating something and Simon Rhodes would be working. And we started enjoying the whole thing and then what became a week became a month. And I talked to the family and then the month became three months. And, um, and then I, I started in early February and I finished on November the 22nd. Yeah, that's a long week. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and at the, from that point onwards, I think part of the enticement was that we had a great time working together. And I meet by, not just James and I, James and I became very good, James and me. I mean, James and I became very close friends, very close friends. Um, 
we had a similar outlook on a lot of things. We had some heritage backgrounds that were similar. And um, we were, um, that we had, there were, there were certain things that, that I think we worked very well. And, and I, as Avatar went along, and then from that point onwards, I sort of evolved my role, or at least my role evolved, in that I started to take more of an role of actually producing the scores so that, that he could he would concentrate on writing themes and doing stuff like that and then we would just uh, the team would work and, and we really we had a great time we enjoyed we had you know the, um, the legendary Jim Henriksen who was the senior music editor Yoda as we all call him um, and then there was you know Dick Bernstein there was Joey Rand other music editors and so on but it was also Rhodes and Jack Redford and me and Ian and and James and we then started doing like Karate Kid. Then it was Spider Man. Then there was a number of other things and so on. And we just had a good time, and it was we enjoyed working with each other. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm very interested in how you you finished Magnificent Seven after James's passing. But was that difficult to get through that whole process? I'd spoken to him the week. I mean, Litchie had been with me. We'd been working on themes in London the week before he died. Um, and he flew back to L.A. because he had just got his solo aerobatics license. It was something he really loved doing. He loved flying. It was a really, you know, yeah. And um, I spoke to him the night before he died. Wow. And... Um, and we were discussing the fact we had three films to do. We were going to do Mag 7, we were going to do Great Wall, and we were going to do Hacksaw Ridge. Right. Um, those he'd agreed to do all three of those. And we were trying to work out how we were going to get all of them done. Um, and I spoke to him the night before. The next morning at 6 a.m., I get a phone call from Jim Henriksen um, uh, saying, telling me what's happened. And I I'm sort of within a day or so I flew back out here um, and I talked with the crew and and we said well we should give Antoine the themes and so uh, so we finished mocking them up and then I flew down to Louisiana where Antoine was shooting this Antoine Fuqua director of Mag 7 um, so I flew down to Louisiana and I gave him and I said, look, you know, this is a gift from, these are James's, you know, we'd like you to have them. And then he said, well, would you, you know, we talked to him, he said, well, then you should finish the score. Go ahead and do that. And so that's what happened. So then, you know, I took the themes and, um, and we, you know, uh, you know, I'm proud of it. I think it's a good score. Yeah, because yeah. it's like the, it's the final tribute to him. Yeah, and I'm very pleased. Um, uh, and Antoine, I think, was um, you know he was he was excellent. I, I you know I think he's a uh, a lovely chap, and I mean a great director and, and a lovely chap. So a couple of final things I just wanted to touch on. Um, a couple of scores that you worked on away from Avatar. Um, you had Tour and Up last year, which. You won an award for last year, mm. and then you had Notre Dame on Fire this year, which yeah. I loved. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about those projects and your thoughts about them? So I, over the years, over the last few years, I, I, but uh, I'd done a number of really interesting projects in China. Um, this was, you know, pre-COVID, obviously, um, which were really rather. They were complex. They were. Uh, unusual, and I got offered one of the, you know, I'd written an oratorio in Mandarin, um, I'd done a, I have an, Im, uh, an immersive, like 240 loudspeaker um, art installation that runs at the top of the Shanghai Tower, um, and I had a, a number of other things, and I was in, um, I was uh, met with one of China's top film directors, and, um, 
and he asked me um, to write the score to Durando, and and one of the things was that, um, uh, and this this is something actually that we're both he and Jean Jacques Arno both ha have one thing in common. You know, is I'd been to China the first time, which was I know to do Wolf Totem, which I'd been the producer, the score producer on that. Yeah. So I that so we both had. Uh, been in China together, but the, the one thing they have both in common is neither of them tempt the film. So, uh, Turin, Curse of Turandot and uh, Notre Dame Brule, both of those were pretty well untempt. And Jean-Jacques would say, I'd say, would you want to do a temp? He said, why would I do that? You're the composer. And um, Xiaolong, the director for Curse of Turandot, the same thing said to me, well, you're the composer, why am I going to put music on there? Um, oh, if only all directors thought that way, right? <laughs> yeah. So you do actually hear effectively my take on those films. Right. In that, you know, they would be. Uh, I did work on themes, like so with Curse and Turandot. Uh, I played him themes until there was a point where he said, I like the, this is the theme for this bit, or this is the theme for that bit, and so on. Yeah. But once we had the, the uh, thematic. Uh, concepts down, and it's true with Jean-Jacques as well, um, then the, he just let me get on and write a score, um, which is obviously hugely, it does make life much simpler in some ways, yeah. um, but you, what you've actually got in Turandot though is, uh, with minimal changes, pretty well what I wrote. Um, there are a few times when we made a couple of minor Things just to allow, allow for dialogue or certain things, but but like Turandot, it was lovely to have these some wonderful Chinese soloists that I recorded in um, with the Sujiang Conservatory of Music. There's some beautiful, amazing uh, players there that we used um, there, and on uh, Notre Dame Brule, I get Jean Jacques allowing me to. Um, go to Saint Cathedral in Burgundy with him. Uh, and they have 500 year old cathedral bells that are the biggest in Europe, I believe. And the two main bells are 26 tons between them. And I was able to go to the top of this cathedral, which is we had to climb up 300 steps all the way, stone steps all the way through the cathedral climb over the top of the main nave, and I've got this amazing picture of w literally walking over the main nave, then climb up the outside so that I could take up some tarpaulins and some ball bearings and start throwing ball bearings at 500-year-old bells <laughs> because I wanted to do creative sampling. Right. And so, um, so I did some whole, remarkable, sam some fabulous sampling uh, fun with, with that. Um, and both in some ways, there's a thing, I mean, Notre Dame, you know, your, your heroine is a 500 year old building, you know, a thousand year old yeah. cathedral. Right. Um, and what, you dis what I discovered was that, you know, you, that thing where you, your characters sort of define the score you're going to write. So to finish, is there anything that you can tell us about Avatar 3 coming up? I can tell you that, Yes, you, I mean, the, there's, they, they've, they've announced both. So the Ash arrive, who are seriously interesting. Um, and um, I can also tell you that there are musical Easter eggs in two that don't pay off until five. Fantastic. Okay, Simon, hey. thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.